Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible and visible? Yes, doctor. Yeah, okay. So we start this IC, this Ectopia Lentis Management Strategy with Emerging Techniques, and we have some of the best speakers here, best experienced surgeons here. Dr. Partha Biswas, Dr. Chitra Ramurthy, they don't need any uh, introduction. Dr. Biraj, all the way from Guwahati. Dr. Siddhartha from Kolkata here. Uh, myself and Dr. Priya Narang from Ahmedabad, a prolific surgeon, and Dr. Surya Gupta. But before we begin this, we start with our uh, the international faculty speaker. Well, uh, just one second. Cursor. The arrow on the left yeah. side. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Chi is with us here, and she is the professor of and senior consultant in ocular. Uh, um, just, I don't know that. Yeah, uh, she is a senior consultant in ocular inflammatory and immunology department of the cataract and comprehensive ophthalmology department of SNEC. She is a professor in pioneering in senior clinician academic ophthalmologist and a teaching legend who has taught almost every single ophthalmologist in SNSC over the past three decades. And she's widely considered and consistently nominated as one of the best teachers in cataract surgery in most, um, most common surgical procedures done globally. Welcome Dr. Chi, nice to have you with us. And as a guest speaker here. Thank you. Um, sorry, I need to open up my screen again for the... Um... I'll play your video, ma'am. Play your video. Yeah, actually, you... I, I don't know why I don't see my... My side, ma'am. You have it? Yeah, yeah, we can see. I don't know why I'm not able to share okay, my, my ma'am, one second. My, my side, please, your video, ma'am. Please wait. Oh, I, I, I can do it. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the AIOS for the opportunity to speak on extreme cases of iris loss. These are my financial disclosures with no relevance to my talk today. Repair of an iris defect, if small or moderate, can be done by suturing either by direct closure or pupil circlage. However, a large iris defect will need to be replaced with iris prosthesis, and this may be made of either PMMA or silicone. Today, my talk will focus on artificial iris. So this is a 48-year-old lady with a bottle cap injury to her left eye, rendering her 6120 in vision with a traumatic madrasis and also as we allowed the trauma to settle, we saw vitreous in the anterior chamber. She developed the intermittent uh, lens that was subluxated with complete zonular loss nasally. So at surgery, you can see this lens is intumescent with vitreous in the anterior chamber which has been stained by the iris pigment and also some blood from the vitreous cavity and you can see the lens wobbling and the first thing to do is to remove this vitreous in the anterior chamber we cannot phaco or aspirate the lens without doing so then we stain under viscoelastic with the trypan blue and you can see that I had attempted a femtosecond laser which did not cut through because I had not increased the energy for the femtosecond laser and you can see now the rexus is a little uh, more difficult because first it's intumescent but also because the zonules are weak and um, after equating an adequate size capsulotomy we are then supporting the equator of this lens bag with a capsule hook and then expanding the equator of the capsular bag in the plane just under the anterior capsule that has been cleaved by viscoelastic. Because the lens is soft, we aspirate after supporting with four hooks. And then before we move on instruments, we put in viscoelastic. And you can see the vitreous cavity is all stained with vision blue. 
After inserting the toric lens and adjusting the alignment, we remove the viscous elastic from under the lens and then refill the anterior chamber and we mark uh, 1.75 mm posterior to the limbus and create the Hoffman pocket at least half scleral thickness deep. Now we create the suture snare with 26 H liters threaded with a Gore-Tex 7O which is called CV8. We use the suture snare, come under the iris remnant, extend a loop of suture to lasso the end of the suture loaded onto the capsule tension segment to the scleral fixation point and we repeat this maneuver for the other end of the suture. So we then retrieve the sutures from the Hoffman pocket and adjust the position of the capsule tension segment into the bag and we repeat this for a diametrically opposite position so that we have a good support of this lens complex. So we are now retrieving the suture ends with this extended loop of suture which lassos the end of the suture to the fixation point at the sclera. Now once we have done that, we retrieve again the sutures from the Hoffman pocket and we are going to ensure that we have no vitreous left in the anterior chamber before we fix this. So we stain again with this time 50% diluted triamcin known as the tonight and ensure that there is no vitreous that is prolapsing around the equator at this point in time. Fill up the anterior chamber with this person viscoelastic and then we adjust the tension of the sutures with the 211 knot to center the hour L within the eye. We don't look at the rexis, but we look at the hour L concentration. And once we have done this, we're then going to reconstruct the iris with an iris, artificial iris from human optics, which we have folded. This is without fiber as we can implant it into the capsule, but it's been refined to 9.5 mm in diameter. And we insert this into the stained capsular bag so you can see that it's going into the bag and not into the sulcus. We grip the uh, pupil there with non-tooth forceps and then insert it and unfold it into the bag. Once we've done that, we remove all the viscoelastic and then uh, that's the end of our case. So you can see here that uh, this patient post-operatively had a good visual outcome and a beautifully reconstructed pupil and you can see the uh, remnant iris following the trauma. So this is another patient who had a post-surgery, a fakir and inner following an extracapsular cataract extraction whereby she lost half her iris and you can see that the better eye was really having a severely uh, brunescent cataract and that's why she underwent uh, extracapsular cataract extraction rather than fecal mastication. So this patient at the time of surgery, we have marked diametrically opposite points and also at 45 degrees in between. Now we're going to ensure that there's no vitreous. So we stain with tramcelone acetonite 50% and we cut with a 23 gauge cutter from the Froca cannula inserted 3.5 mm posterior limbus. Now we're doing a Yamani fixation technique and we have to inject this uh, leading haptic right into the 27 gauge needle and in this case this is a uh, Zycity Lucia uh, 202 which has got haptics made of PVDF so that we do not destroy the haptics as we manipulate it and going 2.2 uh, 2 mm posterior to the limbus uh, 2 mm away from the limbus from the, this point we then insert the 27 gauge needle and thread the trailing haptic into the bevel and retrieve the sutures and apply cautery to create this uh, flange that is not too large and um, we can see because this pupil is widely uh, open that the lens is in reasonable position although it's not perfect we ensure that the flanges are buried into the sclera then we thread a 27 gauge needle with the Gore-Tex 7 on this time we're using artificial iris with fiber from human optics, we trefine to a size white to white diameter plus one round down to 0.5. The next uh, closest 0.5, and then we mark the 45 degree points after creating a perforate iridectomy. So once we've done that, again we mark one mm posterior to the limbus to fixate 
the artificial iris with fiber and we create four hormone pockets that are 90 degrees one to another and then we fold the artificial iris and you see that sutures come uh, in front of the iris and once we have folded it into three we enlarge the incision to 3 mm and insert this with the Kelman forceps holding on to the iris as we unfurl it in front of the intraocular lens as we intraoscular haptic fixated and ensure that the iris goes behind the residual iris and now we are using the suture snare which you can see nicely because there's no iris there uh, we extend the loop of suture thread the end of the suture that we want to bring to the scleral fixation point that's one point the other suture is now uh, going to be threaded through by this extended lasso we pull it and then we can then retrieve the sutures from the Hoffman pocket and we're going to do this for all four scleral fixation points when there's residual iris we go under the iris like you would do with a capsule tension ring we extend the suture loop to lasso the end of the suture uh, uh, suture to the artificial iris at that point and then uh, we retrieve both ends and you can see bit by bit we are going to fixate this really very anchoring it very strongly to the sclera you can do two point fixation uh, opposite the points where the haptics are fixated but you can also do this uh, four points and I prefer to do this generally um, and you can see now we adjust tension to center the pupil to the eye and then we tie and finalize the knots with the two and one knot and slip it back into the Hoffman pocket this is the outcome and you can see this patient in fact achieved good vision with a beautiful pupil 3.36 mm uh, and she's 69 uh, unaided so in conclusion artificial iris can be inserted into the capsular bag that's the one without fiber or suited to the sclerosis the one with fiber and these come from human optics in germany uh, you need to pre-order some of these if you want it to be uh, to match the fellow eye if it is a colored iris uh, this minimizes glare provides a good cosmetic and functional result so extreme iris loss can greatly benefit from artificial iris implantation Thank you very much for your attention. You are muted. Ajay, you are muted. Yeah, yeah. Those artificial irises were just out of the world. I mean, they are, I mean you have to pre-order them, as you say. But then, uh, does it shift or anything? Does it uh, um, cut through or anything? I mean, what's the material, basically? It's silicone. So for most of us in Asia, we are brown iris. Uh -huh. So it's good. You can actually have a standard implant, which is uh, cheaper than yeah. a colored implant, which has to be custom made. And you have to take a photo of the fellow eye and ask them to kind of like match the color and the design and so on. Okay, so it's done by an artist. So it costs a lot more if it were custom made. So for us, we always have some implants with our distributor in Singapore, and we can just get it within 24 hours. So there are two forms. One has fiber backing, which means that it's thicker. And that's the one that you can pass your needle through and not rip through. So that's the one that you suture and anchor to the sclera. The other without fiber, so it's just a silicone uh, material, that's the one that you put inside the capsular bag. Mm -hmm. So for the capsular bag, it's important to emphasize the need for a capsular tension ring so that you don't get capsular phimosis and you get this uh, lens, uh, this, this iris, you know, being squeezed into the anterior chamber. And also you stain it so that you can make sure that it doesn't go into the sulcus inadvertently. And also the rexus should be a little larger so that you can ease it into the capsular bag. Thank you. They are expensive, uh, you know, yeah. but really worth it. Yeah. Any any long term? Uh, I mean, how long have you been using it? I mean, these the segments that you use, the brown color segments that you used to go most of the Indian company also made. You ended up with a glaucoma over a period of time. But these, do you have any this, this sort of complication long term? Uh, not really. But you know, remember that these eyes have also had severe trauma, so they may get angle recession, glaucoma, and so on. Yeah, but you know, these are, that's why I believe in really anchoring four points so that they really don't move. And you know, when you are suturing it, the, the formula for how you size it 
It's actually such that it does not touch the cerebral body and does not cause a UGH. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you. lovely, lovely presentation. I just have one question. Uh, the measurement of the iris, is, is it just white to white? How do you measure the size of the uh, artificial iris? You said something like 9, 9 mm. That's what you said. Okay, 9.5. You know, it's simple. It's 9.5 for a standard eye. If it's a highly myopic eye, it's 10. That's for in the capsular bag. Whereas if you're going to suture it to the sulcus, I mean, various people use different formulas. I take the white to white and then you add uh, one mm and then you round down to the closest 0.5. Yeah. So it's Thank just you. under that one mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd invite our, uh, we start our IC and we have Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy here, the young dynamic ARC chairperson, extremely talented cataract refractive surgeon, founder director of Eye Foundation Coimbatore with multiple branches, always spreading her tentacles all over. I hope she comes next to us in BBI Foundation very Why soon. Why would you want that? <laughs> of course you want that. Uh, always, Nepal is there next to us, so you can also be there. Actually, you always do better with more competition. You reinvent yourself, but yeah. honestly, it's not at all enjoyable to talk after Dr. Suchi because the way she takes you off on subluxation. So anyway, let's make it simple and sweet. Yeah. Dealing with subluxation, thank you very much, Dr. Ajay Paul. It's not only a great friend, a great surgeon, and it's a pleasure to be rather a prestige to be in his course. So when the lens is displaced from its normal position, but remains in the pupillary area, it's subluxated. But when the lens is completely displaced from the pupillary area, it's either anteriorly dislocated or posteriorly dislocated, and you need to plan your action accordingly. Again, it's important for us to know what are the clock hours of dialysis, which you are able to perceive, because you also need to know that Beyond what you perceive, the damage actually might be more when you start operating, but then you need to start planning how you're going to address these. So you need to know what is the degree of zonulopathy, and then you need to know the pathophysiology. Is it a progressive zonulopathy or is it a non-progressive, which would make you less, more conservative than a very radicalized approach? And of course, it depends on the experience of the surgeon. So when you think of lensectomy, you wonder whether you're going to do it in the limbal route or the past planar, and what are the choices of IOLs like AC, IOL, or Isis clip or SFIOL. But if you're planning to do a phaco emulsification in the bag, it all comes to how are you going to stabilize the bag. So then in the basic thing which you need to understand in the air when you have dialysis is there's going to be a pseudo-elasticity which is added on. So it becomes a challenge making a rexis. You need to have a cohesive viscoelastic on the anterior capsule of flap. You need to start your dialysis uh, rexis from the area of intact zonules. You need to ensure that the rexis would be centered if the capsular bag is fixated to the scleral wall. And then it's also important that after creating some amount of rexis, you could actually insert capsule retractors to ensure that you're able to make a nice round rexis. But however, if you were to use a femtosecond laser surgery, these issues of counter resistance are not necessary. But if it is a very grossly subluxated cataract, it does not make a sense to use a femtosecond laser. As I'd earlier said, that stabilization of the capsular bag is either with iris hooks, which gives an anteroposterior kind of a support, or a CTR or a hemat segment or a capsular hook, which will give you a more larger equatorial support. I'm going to take you through surgeries. Now you can see there's at least three to four clock hours of dialysis, a dense cataract, not much of epinucleus. So I'm going to place a capsular hook to provide the equatorial uh, support. And then I'm going to, um, uh, sorry, the anteroposterior support. And then I'm going to push in my CTR through the side port. And I'm going to keep a second instrument to you see that towards the end the CTR insertion, I'm able to hook it and push it into the capsular bag so that it's not overlying the fornices and it does not centralize the bag. It is not buttressing the bag. It is not supporting it. Now, I should also do a good hydro to ensure that the nucleus is freely rotating. That should not increase the area of dialysis with more manipulations. I should also ensure that I do not make the anterior chamber get too shallow at all because that would increase the area of dialysis. I should keep my parameters quite low See, the ease of hydro allows me to rotate, but I have to do it all gentle. Low flow parameters, very gentle manipulation. But in these kind of hard cataract, it's also important that I ensure that I separate the leathery fibers. Because 
we just keeping on doing a fake emulsification without actual separation of the segments you're just nowhere and you are playing in a lax bag although you, all you have yes you have a capsule hook and a ctr there one major advantage is till the nuclear fragments are there they keep the posterior capsule well away because it's a lax capsule so it can get trampolining into the phaco probe while the pieces are there you're actually better off as long as you do not stress the capsule bag inject enough viscoelastic do not shallow your anterior chamber and then when you go on to get your first fragment you ensure that you get the right purchase of the nuclear fragment bring it immediately into the supra capsular space and try not to do too much of work within the capsular bag and the even early times you could do it but as you're coming towards the end of the phaco you need to understand that the back bag is getting a little lax because the nuclear fragments are not there to push the fragments away so you again ensure look at the parameters the vacuum on the parameters have come down and as you come to the last piece you have to be extremely cautious that you really do a supra capsular phaco emulsification and then you need to implant the lens now this is a case of significant subluxation with a traumatic cataract so it's not a progressive cataract so this was done on the femto cataract platform it was a very soft nucleus was taken off you need to remove the cortex but come to the area of dialysis as the last step that's what i wanted to show that if you follow all the uh, principles of operating in a uh, subluxated cataract you can continue the surgery without the subluxation increasing and then you place the ctr such that the long arm of the ctr comes to overlay the area of the maximum weakness and then implant your uh, toric iol which would keep the bag stretched you could get away with just this even in these kind of subluxation if it is non progressive but if it is more then you need to have capsular bag anchoring devices this is an older video wherein of course i do a good hydro i create a centered rexis such that it's decentered here but it is centered once you assume that the capsular bag would be attached to a scleral wall then i would go on to place capsular hooks which are going to give the support because when you place a ctr initially the nuclear manipulation the cortex removal everything becomes a challenge so you could keep the capsular hook on in some cases and not place the ctr right away and then here a cone threaded cone segment is being placed you need to ensure that the eyelet comes to overlay the area of maximum weakness remove your capsular hooks after that position your intraocular lens into the bag and then this uh, now you could do a hofmann's pocket at that time i had created a scleral a triangular flap and then you go on to your routine railroading technique and suture the eye, uh, uh, capsular bag to the scleral wall remove the viscoelastic suture uh, close the flap and the surgery is complete now there is a role of capsule tension segments which are nothing but partial rings with a 5 mm radius of curvature and holes to even wherein you could insert your iris retractor and do a suture fixation now this is a case of a lenticular coloboma and then a hofmann's pocket is being created as you can see here now i would inject a viscoelastic a cohesive viscoelastic it's not that critical here i would plan my rexis but ensure that the rexis is well away from the area of zonular weakness i should i will do a hydro at this point of time but i am doing it because this nucleus is soft because you could have a fluid misdirection when there is a coloboma there and then now i would go in and inject my ctr inside then after placing the ctr and positioning appropriately i would position my uh, 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 i would position my armat segment in the side as you can see i'm threading it and then i would uh, position my armat segment and then suture it and close the case if it is a severe subluxation as this it is truly severe then what i would do is i would create a scleral tunnel as is there and then i would remove it with vectors the pupil is small i just have to do a small little bit of an anterior vitrectomy in these cases and there is not need of a putting a pilocarpin in these eyes but i would place a iris clip lens as a easiest approach and i have made my 3 o'clock 9 o'clock incision i stabilized the iris clip place it behind the iris and just tuck the haptic the iris into the iris tissue into the haptic and do it on both sides and get done with it but last if it's a progressive dialysis you might find that you are caught in a situation with the capsular bag and the iol are all in the vitreous and then you need your posterior segment surgeon to help you get your iol capsular bag complex and then go in place a scleral fixated iol so this is the way the history of a zonular weakness progresses but there are ways to deal if you do it cautiously you could do it just with a ctr ctr and a cts or rarely two cts or in an extreme situation an iris clip lens or a scleral fixated iol is what you would need thank you very much 
cannot start screen while. For cases, yes, you have shown us all the, across the spectrum, all the cases. I think it was wonderful to have you here. I think we have learned a lot, small, small tips. I think we can get you again towards the end when Partha will be there, we'll have some at least 10, 15 minutes discussion. Please be here. I'll try to come and I and don't take this. I really missed uh, missing your uh, webinar. I'm so sorry. Never. Very, very sorry. Yeah, please be with us. Thank you. Thank you. May I welcome the next speaker, Dr. Biraj Goswami. Well, you know, he is a teacher per excellence, formerly a faculty of Guwahati Medical College and then of Shankar Deva Netralai, Guwahati. And right now he runs his own center, director of Guwahati Eye Center with the 25 years of experience. So you would have a lot of little bit tips. What to wear. You have seen some great surgery by Dr. Chi and then followed by Dr. Chitra. Oh, ready to go. Yeah, can you, uh, yeah, make it full screen? Yeah, yeah, this one, this one, yeah, fine. Yes, welcome. So a beginner's dilemma, next eight minutes, he'll take us through that. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. And uh, welcome, uh, well, I mean, good afternoon to everybody. I just pray that uh, everybody is um, safe and uh, spirited. And thank you once again, Ajay, for selecting such a good subject for me, Tapsular Support Devices, The Beginner's Dilemma. Uh, in the language of the McDonald's, I am loving it. I'm loving it because I always consider myself as the beginner and I can very well visualize what are the beginner's dilemma and problems. And, um, and thank you for letting me play in this wonderful innings of but dangling lenses. I do not have any financial interest in any of the products. Now why capsular support devices are required? Surely, the answer will be whenever we feel that the capsular, I mean, genular support is not strong. Because the weak genular support increases the risk of intra and post operative complications. Like postural capsular rupture, vitreous loss, the nucleus may be dropped, the whole lens may be dropped, eye will may be dropped, eye will can decentralize. Uh, I mean, if, if it is not in the table, then later on. So capsular support devices facilitate the back stability during the surgery and prevents these complications and ensures the eye will centration. Now, these are certain conditions where we get the zonulopathy. This is more of an academic slide. Now, the approach is basically on, as uh, Dr. Chitra has mentioned, that etiology, whether it is non-progressive or progressive, and the grading of the zonular dialysis, and whether it is localized or there is a diffuse uh, uh, sparing of zonules. Uh, so Dr. Chitra has already mentioned all this, but I'm just highlighting because highlighting will definitely benefit the beginner. Now, how to grade the zonular weakness? Minimal, mild, moderate, and severe. When there is no clinically overt loss of the zonules, and we can faintly see a uh, phacodonesis, maybe focally accentuated, it is minimal. And when there is a clinically overt um, zonulolysis, but it is less than four clock hours, then it is a mile. When it is four to eight clock hours, that means in terms of degree, it is 120 to 240 degree, then it is more um, uh, moderate and there will be definite phacodonesis gross and severe, the lens is practically dangling in the anterior vitreous phase, because it is more than eight clock hours loss. We have got two different types. Already Chitra has shown that capsular retractors, they are like pupillary hooks. Uh, they are universal almost. Implants, there may be circumferential, like a capsular tension ring and the modified versions of it. And uh, there may be localized um, that is uh, CT segments, that's the capsular tension segments. The goals of the implants and purpose of the implants are different from the goals and purpose of the retractors. The implants apply outward force at the equator, which is distributed in the entire capsular surface, uh, circumference, but it doesn't uh, support the bag in the anterior posterior direction. But it stabilizes the lens beautifully, gives a good eye wheel centration, and reduces the capsular contraction force, CCF, in phimosis pros conditions. But sometimes it interferes with the cortex aspiration also. 
on the other hand the capsular retractors provides the focal support as the artificial zonules during phacoemulsification of course in the anterior posterior direction but it doesn't have any supportive function once it is removed and neither it can prevent phimosis but it has got a good effect that it doesn't interfere with the cortex aspiration now when to insert definitely retractors are inserted immediately after ccc and hydro otherwise it doesn't have any role and implants any time after ccc i prefer at a later stage if the situation permits my management protocol is like this the minimal i will go for um, a three piece lens and select uh, the i mean so see the site of the suspect and go, so put the rigid haptics in that direction if it is not progressive during the surgery. In the mild, I will go for a simple CTR with or without retractor. But in the moderate, I will start with the retractor and do, go for a combination of CTR plus CT segment or a modified CTR. In the severe, I will go all the way, everything possible. If everything is not adequate, take out the lens and go for the alternative eye wells, suicide eye well, glued eye well, AC eye well, iris fixated eye well, etc. So my request to the beginners is not to start any case of zonular lysis unless and until you finish 300 to 500 good capsular axis and go, I mean, um, good FACO. And if you have that, then you can go for minimal and mild, but moderate you start only after you have got a four figure under your belt and severe you never try unless and until you have got exposure to, to these alternative eye, eye wells and you do not have a vitreoretinal colleague with you. This is my last slide, but it is very important for the beginner because the beginner will have hiccups. Number one hiccup, that the leading edge hits the capsular phonics and doesn't progress. What to do? My advice will be just withdraw a little bit or totally fill up with visco and reinsert. CCC too small, there may be problem with the CTR release. It may be prematurely released. And sometimes it may go to the sulcus. In that case, it pushes the back causing further dialysis. So it is dangerous. CCC too large, the entire CTR may be extruded to the sulcus, and sometimes we may be oblivious to it. In both these conditions, I will again suggest that do 300 to 500, go well controlled, well centralized CCC for 4.5 to 5 millimeter, then go for these cases because that is very important to put a CTR before knowing whether your CCC is too small or too large. The hook is not released from the eyelet, no problem. Just use the repositor to gently tap. And if you have, I mean, the last one is very important that capsular rejector may not be very friendly to, be, uh, I mean, to the CTR or the CT segment. If it is CTR, leave the retractor for, uh, I mean, while uh, inserting the CTR and guide the CTR posteriorly to the equator. And if it is CT segment or modified CTR, then release the retractor before completing insertion. I had a video, but I do not have the time. I just say that it is a moderate, uh, fair, uh, I mean, uh, the dialysis. We can see that 180 to 200 dialysis. And here I would just show that how meticulous our CCC should be there so that we can retract with the retractors very nicely. And in that case, we will not see the I mean, zonular lysis, but that is temporary. So we will put a permanent one that is the CTR. And at the end, I will be putting one um, CT segment also uh, that is already shown. My last, my take home message is that Courage and confidence is very, very welcome and it, it should be there. But overconfidence may be dangerous at times. So please be selective in your case. Do not take a progressive cause etiology and take only the minimal and mild ones. Thank you so much, Ajoy. Once again, I, um, I conclude with my uh, repeating my wish to everyone to stay safe and spirited. That was wonderful.
I mean, you have shown the hit the bell, how a uh, beginner should do and what are these do's and don'ts. I think this is a really learning point from a teacher like you who has taught students over the last 25 to 30 years. I would, you would stay on as we'll have discussion towards the end. I invite now my friend, colleague, Dr. Shiddhartha Ghosh. We are from the same medical college back in Assam. He's the, right now he's the head of the department of GD. I uh, diabetic center and uh, eye center and also Nightingale and Apollo Hospital. Uh, he is a national and international presenter, has won a lot of accolades both in ESCRS and AIOS video competition in challenging cases. And today he will be speaking to us on traumatic and intraoperative ectopia mentis. Yes, over to you, Shiddhar. Thank you, Ajay. Am I audible and yeah, are the yeah, slides yeah, visible? Yeah, yeah, visible and audible. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Ajapal, for uh, the kind introduction, and uh, it's an honor to be in your course. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, discuss about traumatic and intraoperative uh, ectopia lentis. Well, uh, we all know that ectopia lentis is defined as displacement or malposition of the crystalline lens of the eye, and the commonest cause being trauma. Well, uh, all we are going to discuss about uh, the management here is uh, the basic goal is to restore as much normalcy as possible and to look at you know, long-term results because this generally uh, happens in younger age group, more in the younger age group. Well, let us start with this traumatic one, uh, a blunt trauma. The whole clear crystalline lens is dislocated in the anterior chamber. And as you can see, uh, there is vitreous because the pupil is dilated and it has been there for some time. So my approach was to make a scleral tunnel. And of course you could have gone uh, to the first planar route, but that would be appropriate because you would have uh, caused a lot of injury, you would have had to push it back to the vitreous. So it's an anterior vitrectomy to release all the attachment of the vitreous with the lens. And of course, uh, with the wear vectors, you can gently take it out, but, but my calculation was slightly wrong. It's a big uh, rexis, so uh, it's a uh, big nucleus. And so I had to push it gently with a iris repositor and it comes out. Then uh, I go ahead with further vitrectomy. And as we uh, go, we see there is a small dialysis at uh, six o'clock. And thereafter, you know, we manage with lenses. I'll come little uh, in a little way. This is another case. This is a spontaneous dislocation I would call because there was no major uh, trauma, history of trauma. So the whole, uh, you know, hypermature Morgagnian cataractus lens was uh, dislocated in the anterior chamber. In a similar way, it was easy to take out because the uh, uh, lens size has reduced. And uh, as uh, we all uh, we have already discussed, there are few options. In these cases, I prefer a scleral fixating or a retro uh, iris fixation. In this case, of course, this was a routine, uh, you know, uh, scleral fixation by glue, and this is how. We all go, the leading haptic to be taken out uh, is to be extraterized with uh, one of the forceps and then we take the other haptic out once this is taken out. And uh, I'll go, because of one drop time, I'll go here a little fast and uh, the other haptic is also taken out uh, through the other uh, port. And once that is done, the pupil is small, so we push the optic behind, and then we can tuck the haptics in the preformed sterile tunnels. This is the other way. I use a uh, AC maintainer at times that uh, creates a lot of good comfort in the AC. It maintains the AC, and uh, things become smoother for us. And uh, once the the same thing is repeated, a handshake technique to take out the trailing haptic, and once both are uh, out, we go ahead tuck it in the preformed scleral channel and then we uh, kind of uh, reposit the flaps and use uh, glue to uh, you know complete the case and uh, the peritomy the conjunctiva is also uh, closed so this is how we complete this kind of cases this is just the other uh, kind of lens that i generally prefer in this case this is fast and simple dr ram uh, chitra ramurthy has also shown it's a iris clip lens and it's easy to tuck it behind the uh, iris and uh, it's very simple, less time consuming and later on uh, long term results are pretty good because you can dilate and see the fundus and uh, the only issue is the pupil size 
maybe initially not so round, but uh, gradually with time it becomes round and uh, uh, there are no long-term problems as of now. Well, this is uh, another case. This uh, uh, patient, uh, he's a young patient, but uh, had a history of uh, UBITs about one year back, but no other history of trauma or anything. So this is a soft nucleus, as you can see. Uh, and uh, once the hydro procedures are done, and we, I found that, uh, you know, it's not free. So I thought there must be some corticocapsular additions. So mechanically, I tend to kind of rotate and uh, sweep and rotate, first sweep and then rotate. But I feel that I have done it too vigorously, might have injured uh, uh, zonules. This is one point of caution. And here I would like to uh, ask you to see that the bag is wobbling here. It's just floating sometimes. And as you see now, it's still floating. I don't know if you can make out from the quality of the video. And now something has happened, I understand. So I uh, kind of back, uh, uh, come out and see with the, I inflate the bag. I want you to see once again, I inflate the bag with, it has all come out with uh, viscoelastic. Now I understand I have a little bit of cortex remaining. So I need to stabilize the uh, bag. I could have done it with a, with a pair of hooks, uh, capsular hooks as well. But I thought, okay, in the long run, I'll have to put a, a CTR. So I did it at the first go. And uh, after I do it, it's really, I've injured a lot of uh, the zonules there. So now with tangential pull, I can take out the cortex uh, with little difficulty, but uh, it's done. And once this is done, I, as planned, what I do here is I put a, a multi-piece foldable aisle. And here, I'll go a little fast. It's uh, very easy to put it. Uh, what we do is we put the lens in the sul uh, sulcus. And thereafter, very carefully, we put it in the sulcus and do an optic capture so that the IL remains stable all throughout. Now, this patient is here with five years follow-up with us and he's perfectly fine. The lens is right in the in position. So th that was a real bad intraoperative uh, zonular dialysis that I had created. Now, this is an extreme trauma. Uh, again, a blunt trauma. Uh, this lady is 20 years old, uh, 28 years old and she presented to us two, uh, two months after this uh, trauma. And as you can see, there is a huge amount of iridodialysis as well. So uh, what I planned was, again, a scleral fixation, uh, fixation of IOL with uh, glue. And uh, uh, as you can see, to begin with, I uh, anchored the iris to one side with two iris hooks and then went ahead with uh, vitrectomy. I could use uh, the port one uh, millimeters behind because there was no iris, so I could uh, go through there and do vitrectomy, lensectomy. It's very much valid. And once that is done, I go ahead with the uh, you know the uh, glue dial technique. I'll go a little past here and uh, I'll skip this part for want of time. And again, once we uh, once we tuck the uh, haptics in the uh, in the preform channels in the sclera, we uh, I go ahead with the repair of the iridodialysis. I take away the two iris hooks and release the iris from there. And uh, thereafter, I start suturing, repairing the iridodialysis. And uh, I use all kinds of uh, tricks here to do it. And uh, the simplest one was uh, simplest effective. One was to use a slip knot, and which would actually uh, pass to the uh, interior inside, and then we need to cut the knot ends uh, from inside the eye. So that is how it was easily done and very effectively done. So we can use a micro scissor, or okay, if it, if my time is up, I'll just uh, show that we cut the loose ends, and uh, and that is how we complete the case here. And uh, the only problem here, the patient is doing fine, but the only problem here is, you know, uh, she has uh, glaucoma, persistent glaucoma, and being controlled with two medications. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Siddhartha, for showing us those amazing surgeries, I mean, especially that eye well, which was uh, there in the 
I mean, almost dangling and the lens and the back dangling. I think that was amazing. And the last case is Iris Nogo. I think uh, we could have taken them. Dr. Chi must have watched us <laughs> doing that. Okay. So I come with the ectopia lentis, the come to advantage, the back fixation techniques. Well, we have seen that uh, Lexis, uh, we have shown uh, earlier, almost three surgeries have been shown how well it can be done, but it's not always Hank Dory. So these are things where there are problem and the rexis goes uh, to the periphery. So rexis is unpredictable in uh, in subluxated cataracts. Let's be very clear about it. And capsulorexis is definitely, if you get the right down center, that is an advantage, but if you can't get it, you can always have some problem. And capsular support devices, Dr. Uh, Biraz has shown us all this now. This becomes the standard CONE CPS here, remains the standard of care for this uh, and the tenoprolein sutures that have been and the long-term you know, stabilization is good with the present generation. But what is new, let us come to that. Now this, I've just come to see the rexis can be a tough job as you can see in this case, the rexis, you are trying to get it and match it. And many a time, see, we put a, even a, a iris hook to keep it, but not always that we end up there, especially in this extreme subluxation, it really becomes difficult. And especially if we are doing the nuclear fragmentation, you have got an unstable bag, and getting that nucleus, chopping it sideways, definitely this flax has actually changed the paradigm how we do that uh, rexis. You can see that how what we are doing is there and positioning the, uh, I can see the how, where the lens is and accordingly I change the rexis position. This was a traumatic cataract, you can see the almost uh, 90 degrees of luxation. I've done my rexis with the femto. It's so easily removed after that. Many times there are tilt. You may not be able to remove it, but then to correct that tilt, I do put viscoelastic by the side. And the first thing I do is do the anteroposterior support. I put the uh, capsular hooks. The capsular hooks go and support it. My CTR goes in. Now CTR goes in and supports it in the periphery. So once I've done, see the emulsification becomes so easy with this hard cataract. I don't have to, just have to keep my left hand pressure and the right hand just pull it out, get it emulsified. So no further increase in the, uh, in the back fluxation. There is that I get it right and then the last pieces are taken out and it works very nice. Now, Once I've done that, there is vitreous there. So I remove the vitreous by a little bit of vitrectomy there. Once I've done that, I put that lens just like uh, Dr. Siddhartha showed. In this case, I'm putting the lens in the sulcus and the lens goes in the sulcus. Uh, no, in the back. This case, I'm putting the lens in the back. See, you can see the lens. Since the subluxation was not much, the lens goes, the multi-piece lens goes in the back and it has maintained this, uh, the central part. And so I go next to the next case, as you can see, this very loud central pupil, and it has continued. Now, this is another case where the you can see this uh, have moved the rexis to the periphery. So I've got the, the round globular lens that is there. Once that is there, you see the, the uh, femtogosia, and see this, there is a tilt there. And so with that tilt, I'm trying to get that rexis cleared up. I've just this a soft cataract as I'm trying to clear that rexis and tear that rexis because of the tilt, you cannot get the total marks, but then it corrects normally the machine corrects up to 15 degree tilt. But if it is more than that, many times you can miss it. So I'm continuing in the same process again, doing the viscous section, putting the uh, hooks and the CTR. Once that CTR is there, you can see the CTR goes in and this is a uh, the CTR goes in. This is a soft cataract, so I don't have to struggle much to remove that. Once I've removed that, uh, so I'm putting this lens, I'm putting in the sulcus. As you see, this was a almost uh, 100 and more than 180 degrees subluxation. Later on, it was looking like 270 degrees subluxation. I just put the lens in the sulcus and then capture it in the bag. Now, this patient is almost on the follow up for almost eight months now. And uh, I think I've uh, done it just after the last time the, the lockdown had opened, the month of Ju July, August. So there, the lens is there, well centered. Now, this is again another case of Marfan's the, uh, syndrome. Now, this is a progressive type of zonal dehiscence. So what I do is the same way. I just go and 
get my the the, uh, the capsular hooks and this is a soft cat track so all i need to is to just to suck those material by bimanual ia and um, a single piece lens goes in the uh, bag and what i'm trying to do is uh, modify my way of instead of putting suture i'm putting a iris hook there with the city segment and there i can tuck it right inside the sclera once I've tucked it, I've got it right in the position. And this patient is almost on the follow-up for almost more than 18 months now. And it is doing absolutely fine. Well, we have seen nice cases, but it is not always hanky-dory. And this case, as you can see, the flag phantom may not be always useful as this case, see, as I'm trying to do it in the periphery there. It's got my uh, Rex is there. Once I've got, it's not, it's an incomplete Rex. So all I have to do is hold it here by the Rex forceps. And once that is done, see, I have to hold it. And then the uh, the Rex goes a little bit to the periphery. But somehow I did manage this case. I just wanted to show that always it may not be possible if the tilt is more than 180 degree. In this case, it was more than that. And coming over the Newer capsular uh, supports. Now you see, I've done it. If you look at it, this is one. You know, this is one of our uh, earlier co-instructor, Dr. Jacob. She has got it out, and this you can see. You can just pull it and tuck it the way. This is the idea that I've used for my last case. And so there are a lot of uh, papers to support this management of cataract acidic. Dr. Chi is here. She has got a lot of uh, work on that that has shown, and there's a uh, study by. Dr. Tithyal et al. was shown that the femtosecond laser pretreatment allows a close chamber creation of corneal incision and capsulotomy. And this vitreous of AC did not hamper femtosecond laser because you have got vitreous in AC in the traumatic cataract, you can still do it. And this is again uh, another study. We saw the application of femto laser assisted treatment enhances surgical safety and effectiveness of subluxatomies and promotes maximum recovery of the patient. So thank you, thank you. This is a new armamentarium in our hand, and if you can use it uh, in in the selected cases where the where the you know, tilt is not so much, it definitely gets good result. Thank you. Now we have uh, Dr. Priya. Is she here? Yes, Dr. Priya. Yeah, please welcome. Dr. Priya Narang is from the Narang Eye Center, of, you know, Ahmedabad. An extremely talented, dynamic young, young surgeon and author of many books on blue diavel, on the diavels in this sort of situations, and a lot of publication, a lot of international and national accolades. Welcome, Dr. Priya, please. Yeah, you're seen. Your slide is visible. Yep. Uh Thank you so much, Dr. Ajay Paul, for having me here. And uh, well, Dr. Ajay, he wanted me to cover up the IOL choices, but I think that uh, almost uh, the entire thing has been covered up already. But anyway, uh, I will try to just go through all the choices uh, uh, that are available as of now. So uh, we all know this has already been discussed that it's the displacement or the mal malposition. It may be partial, it may be total. And uh, uh, the management, actually, it depends upon what type of disorder is it, whether it's a progressive or a non-progressive zonulopathy, you have various degrees of subluxations, you might have a mild, moderate, or a severe kind of thing. So your modality of treatment actually uh, depends upon the clinical scenario, which is present there. You have wide choices. You, you might have a one-piece or a three-piece whole liberal to put inside. Again, that's a personal choice. Many of the surgeons, they would like to go ahead with a three-piece uh, I will, that's my personal choice in all these cases, but there are surgeons who are also using one piece foldable intraocular lenses. You have various other beautiful uh, capsular bag supporting devices, which can be used uh, uh, in association with uh, the intraocular lenses and the CTR. So uh, what I'll try to just showcase and run through these uh, uh, videos, this is a mild sort of subluxation that you will be seeing uh, maybe around uh, 60 degrees or something of that kind. And uh, this is a routine cataract surgery that we try to go ahead with this. But whenever we have cases like this, you know, uh, we have to be very careful and you have to be ready with plan B if plan A actually does not work in your cases. So uh, as it was said before, doing a capsulorex is uh, quite difficult. Many a times you might have, you know, a lot of phagodonesis going on at that point of time. It might 
hinder you from doing a capsular rexis. So then you also need to support your rexis. Meanwhile, I have seen many of the surgeons, you know, supporting the rexis uh, with the with the hooks or with the capsular bag. Again, it depends upon the, uh, sorry, the capsular hooks depends upon the uh, personal choice. So as you see in this case, you know, pegoid mussification could be done and um, uh, the things, they progressed quite well. It did not seem that there was a major kind of uh, uh, pegoidonesis during this, the capsular bag is good. So this case seems to be quite simple and, you know, you can just go ahead and you can uh, place up the capsular ring inside the uh, uh, capsular bag. So that works and helps in distension of the capsular bag at that point of time. And uh, you have to be very careful when you slip this uh, uh, capsular tension ring inside because, you know, once it goes inside the capsular bag and into the equatorial area, uh, it's very difficult to get it back. So when it goes inside, it's always there. Secondly, uh, I prefer to use a three-piece intraocular lens for one, very one simple reason that, you know, in case if I come up with any other uh, subluxations or any other complications in future, I can convert this case directly into a uh, glued oil procedure. I won't have to externalize or remove this uh, intraocular lens. Now, in this case, there's also a defect uh, uh, in the iris. So uh, the uh, preferred surgery for me is the single pass go through plastic procedure, which I have pioneered into. Uh, this uh, surgery. So this surgery, it actually works very beautifully. You have to take just four throws and you are just done with the um, uh, procedure. It's just a single pass. So that is how it derives its name. Uh, so, uh, and there is minimal intraocular uh, manipulation uh, with this single pass with the procedure. So this is a preferable method for me. Uh, going on to a next case, if you have a case like this, you know, uh, I do not believe in putting Sioni's ring and then fixing it up because this is a massive kind of thing. And um, you will be stretching the capsular back to a maximum extent, you know, if you uh, try to uh, fix it, this kind of, I've seen many of the surgeons, again, it's a personal choice. Uh, in the end, you know, actually what happens is you are over distending the capsular back when you have such a massive kind of thing. So these uh, capsular, in these cases, I prefer to do lensectomy with vitrectomy and then go ahead and uh, do in a glued aisle, secondary aisle fixation. So actually what happens, you know, uh, in these cases is that whenever you are doing a glued eye procedure, you should be having a fluid infusion inside the eye. And that's very important. Uh, first thing is that do not do a secondary eye fixation without fluid infusion uh, because you do not want the eye to collapse during the procedure. Secondly, when you are doing a lensectomy, you have to be very careful that when you are trying to cut it off with the um, uh, vitrectomy probe, uh, uh, you do not uh, uh, encapsulate the iris tissue inside the vitrectomy cutter because that, that can happen at any point of time because you're working at a very high um, uh, cutting rate and also uh, with the moderate amount of vacuum that is going on at this point of time. Although you keep on clipping in between the uh, vitrectomy cutter and the uh, uh, vacuum, but still you have to be very careful with it. Secondly, when you have very big eyes and where uh, you must have seen that I've created a peripheral iridectomy, we try to do this because, you know, when you enter inside, you do not want to, when you do a sclerotomy, you do not want to drag the peripheral iris tissue. So this is how the three-piece foldable intraocular lens is being now loaded. And when this sclerotomy, uh, through, uh, when the uh, glural forceps or the end opening forceps goes inside from the sclerotomy side, at that point, we try to create a peripheral iridectomy so that there is no dragging of the iris tissue. Because what happens, you know, when you have a big eye, you're trying to come anterior uh, and you're trying to do this. So you might uh, pull off the peripheral iris tissue. So in order to prevent that, peripheral iridectomy is done. This is a very, very clinical important point, uh, which should be taken into consideration. Uh, what I want you all to appreciate is, although the haptics are being externalized, because fluid infusion is continuously on. So this is very important, which I see missing in many of the surgeons doing uh, uh, secondary oil fixation procedures. They try to do it without a fluid infusion. Uh, I think uh, fluid infusion is a must. Uh, that uh, really makes uh, your surgery quite easy. And even the post-operative outcomes are really good because, yeah, you know, there's a minimal uh, manipulation that is going on when you have a fluid. It has to go. You cannot work in a uh, collapsed eye. So having done that, having the fixated and having uh, put these into the sterile pockets, you are all set and you're all done for this case. Although it's not so simple, as it looks in the video, it's, it has its own challenges, but uh, uh, that is what uh, I think um, uh, uh, comes with the experience of a surgeon. So fluid infusion, you can use a uh, anterior chamber maintainer also. It's not necessary to use a trocar infusion. You can use that and you can do it when you are putting up the glue, you need to dry, dry up the entire surface area. There should be no fluid coming. Otherwise it washes off whatever amount of glue that you are putting into it. 
uh, I would like to show you one more thing is that, you know, when you might be having a cases like this, you know, microspherophagy and a wandering lens, lens moving around everywhere. So in these cases, the lensectomy with vitrectomy is done. Uh, I'll try to show one of the methods uh, that uh, we have tried doing it recently is that, you know, it's a handshake debating flange technique, which I published in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. So I'm trying to show you this uh, in cases of opaquia, in case if you want to do that. And, yeah, let me move this. Uh, what you need for this surgery is you need a 26 gauge needle and you need a three piece uh, PMM in intraocular lens. What is actually done in this surgery is what you see in this animation, the initial steps are similar like what you do in a Yemeni. Uh, two millimeter by two millimeter markings and you take the needle, 26 gauge needle and it goes inside, you take a three piece whole lever. The problem in our country is that we do not get uh, haptics, PVDF haptics, we do not have those lenses here. So we have to do with whatever we have into our practice. So what you see here is that, you know, after externalization and after the flange that has been created, what has been described by Yemeni, uh, the flange was pressed. So that is what we call it as a revetting. Uh, we try to do this revetting, why? Because, you know, we have used a 26 gauge needle. Actually, even the thin gauge needle is also not uh, very commonly available. So you can use, you can do this method, use a 26 gauge. When you create a rivet, you know, there's no way that your haptic is going to slip back because the intrasteral tract, which is created with a 26 gauge needle is comparatively larger than what is created with a 30 gauge needle. So when you're using a 30 gauge, you can just create a flag, but when you're using a 26 gauge, you want to prevent the slippage back inside. So it is always better to create a rivet. So that works very beautifully. Otherwise, uh, most of the steps are quite similar to what we do in a Yamane method. The second advantage with the handshake rivetting is that when you have externalized the thin haptic and when you have uh, created this rivet, uh, what actually happens is that you can again push back the leading haptic inside. So, you know, your trailing haptic takes the original position. So you won't have any issues with externalization of the trailing haptic. So that is another advantage that goes on with this uh, uh, procedure. So this procedure it actually works very beautifully. You see here how the rivet is being created and then it is pushed back inside. I'll just run because I think we are running short of time. So once this goes back, you can just manipulate the trailing haptic and it becomes very easy to flex this. Otherwise, this is the surgical step where most of the surgeons, they keep on struggling. Uh, you can do a handshake technique and then uh, you can just go ahead with that. You need not bother about the leading haptic. It is not going anywhere. Otherwise, what happens is that if you do a double needle method in this, uh, you will also be having the other previous needle inside the eye. So this is uh, one of the methods that really works very well. I'll just forward this a little bit. This is an uh, uh, OCT which shows that. This is another video, but I think I need to stop this here. This shows the similar method. So uh, thank you so much. I think I could not cover much more in this, but anyway, thank you so much. Priya, I think there was wonderful and the small tips, how you change that the way the Yamani is done with the 26 gauge, not availability of the lens. And, and that there was wonderful, wonderful. It's always a pleasure to see you every time with the newer ways of doing the same blue dial that we've been doing over the years. But thank you, thank you. Please stay on. Mm -hmm. I would invite now the second last speaker, Dr. Surya Gupta, well, he has got a new look, Yul Brainer changed. Well, is the director of Alo Eye Care, an extremely talented and a naturally gifted surgeon that I've seen him grow over the years, mastering not only all surgery, even mastering all the complications. And he, here he is with us to tell us all the complications because he has mastered, got all the awards in ESCRS showing all the challenging master cases. Over to you, Surya. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Paul. And um, let me just share. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. So um, thank you, uh, Dr. Paul, for uh, allowing me to be a part of this session and for the wonderful introduction. Every time your introduction surpassed last year's introduction, although I have done nothing new. <laughs> Um, so talking about disasters and trams, I would just like to share a couple of videos. In my first video, this is a young adult with a traumatic cataract. And uh, you can see that uh, this area is the subluxation. So I do a rexis, but the capsule is quite elastic for two reasons. It's a young patient. And secondly, this area here, it uh, uh, doesn't have any zonular support. But finally, I get a good rexis. You can appreciate the rexis is very well centered to the pupil. So implant the CTR. Now the CTR kept slipping out from this area. So I thought maybe this the, the angle of implantation was not correct. So I went in deeper. 
through the main port and even then even when i'm making the ctr more vertical it was still slipping out in that area so i decided let me change my area uh, angle of implantation so i go in through one of the side ports now this side port had a very acute almost a 90 degree angle of attack and you can see it's pulling the whole capsule to one side and i decided this is not a great idea so um I decided to abandon this side port also. So now I go in from the other side port. Now this side port looked much more uh, inviting. The CTR almost went in throughout the whole area. But again, whenever it was coming in this region, it was slipping out. Now I realized my mistake. The mistake I had made was the first of all, the Rexis had margin was very close to the equator. So the, the overhanging edge offered no support at all. And secondly, this uh, the the pupil it was the, the ctr was the, the rexis was centered very centered to the pupil and not centered to the lens so that was one of the disasters i encountered we had to abandon that case and uh, we had to simply go ahead with implantation of um, uh, some spiral fixated lens now this is another traumatic case uh, the capsulate this is an old case capsulate quite fibrosed uh, difficult to make a puncture here I apologize for the quality of the video. But finally, with the help of very sharp 26 gauge uh, needle bent cystodome, we could make a rexus flap. Now, in these cases, I have learned my lesson that it's better to support the nucleus and offer counter traction by, with the help of another second instrument. This way, you can get a good rexus. And the rexus is well centered to the lens and not to the pupil, like the mistake I had made in the previous case. Now here, I go in with the implantation of the CTR early in the uh, game, but then I wanted to implant hooks and I could not implant the hooks because you can see that I had lost the edge of the rexus margin because of all the loose cortical fiber. Now here is a nice trick I have learned that what you can do is you can hydro the bag with blue and then it will stay in the inside of the bag and you can identify the margins of the bag and proceed with your uh, phaco emulsification and surgery. Now, this is another case, uh, again, a traumatic cataract, fairly uh, soft cataract. You can see I have placed all the hooks here to support the bag in the area of subluxation. The fecal emulsification is going on quite decent. The parameters are quite low, bottle height is high. The nucleus is also quite mobile. I, I don't expect to uh, have any uh, complications here. But this is when Murphy's Law strikes. Here, there's a, there was an empty space here. And what had happened was the posterior capsule was flapping like a flag in the wind and it caught my phaco tip and I created a rent. Not actually a rent, I ate almost all of the posterior capsule. So this was another disaster. The lesson I learned is you have to create a tension in the equatorial area by placing a CTR and then that helps to keep the posterior capsule taut and doesn't flap and doesn't come to your phaco tip. So in this disaster, we again had to abandon uh, implantation of any lens inside the bag and we had to go in for some sort of spiral fixation. So this was another mistake I made. This is a case where we had done a very good anterior vitrectomy traumatic case. There was no capsule here. So we planned implantation of a scleral fixated IOL uh, with the help of sutures. Now, again, the mistake I had made here is I don't have any sort of posterior chamber uh, irrigation here. Now, what problem that it causes is that it causes a lot of hypotony whenever I'm putting any instrument inside the eye because the water leaks out. Here you can see because there is no support of fluid from the posterior uh, chamber, the nucleus, the lens flips. And I have, I have a very hard time keeping the lens in its supposed to be a physiological position. You can see how soft the eye is. Had I had a posterior chamber maintainer here, it would have, the fluid would have maintained and pushed the lens flat and kept it flat like this. Well, finally, I could keep the, get the lens in a, a decent natural position, uh, but then now I have an iris caught here. The iris, the underside of the iris is caught to the suture here. You can see the pigments coming out. So this was another problem. Now, uh, I, I continuously have to maintain the anterior chamber by putting in fluid intermittently. I try to free, free the iris from the suture with the help of viscoelastic, doesn't help, but finally with the help of a spatula, I could free the knot from the undersurface of the iris. Now, now things are looking on the brighter side, go in suture one end of the, as you can see by the depression on the 
California. It's quite soft tie. Now the last going to the other side, I put a triple knot suture and I pull too hard. And I have torn off one end of the suture. I still haven't realized I have torn one end of the suture. I'm still trying to try it. And then I realize I've torn it. So now I have one end completely sutured, the other end just held in position with the help of one triple knot. Now what to do in this situation? I'm thinking. So here first I, I decide to uh, uh, close the main port and keep the chamber tight. I, I again put fluid in, again the mistake that I don't have any chamber maintainer here. So I decide that let me take a bite from under the, uh, the, the flap, sterile flap here with a fresh suture and I can tie the other suture with the fresh suture which is tied to the sclera. It will serve the same purpose, it will be fixated to the sclera. But when I'm doing that, I'm so focused on taking a bite from the undersurface of the sterile flap that I have inadvertently even torn the other suture also. So now I just have a knot. I don't know how tight that knot is, how close it is. You can see here in close slow motion that I am, while holding the flap up, I've also uh, uh, inadvertently uh, caught the suture here also. So now I don't know how stable the lens is. I try to tap the lens up and down just to make sure whether it fall, falls down or not, whether there's any movement. Because I can't even free the lens. It's already a triple knot is already there. So I can't free the lens. If I could free the lens, I maybe I could take the haptic out, re-suture and go on uh, again with a, a fresh shot of spiral suturing. Thankfully, you know, fortune favors the brave and the luck was on my side. So the lens is fairly stable. This poor chap is actually a tea stall owner right next to our old hospital and uh, he's still there and the lens is still there. So being lost to follow up is not a issue with this patient, but thankfully by the grace of God, he's fine. So these are all my disasters and triumphs I wanted to share with you. I hope that uh, the mistakes I have made would help to, uh, you know, uh, rectify or prevent you from making the same mistakes over and over again. Thanks. So I think that was wonderful, wonderful. We have shown us all the mistakes that we do every day. It's just that we have given our mistakes, we made you to show us so that we show the good ones. You are kind enough to show us. I mean, those, especially the one that I think the Priya just now said that you have to have an infusion while putting in these lenses, any of these lenses, not having an infusion. I know a lot of old timers, you know, they still do with some little bit of visco. And now this is very important point that either a AC maintainer or a parse planner. Now I welcome none other than Dr. Parthu Biswas. Uh, Dr. Paul, yeah. I, I would just like to take your leave. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I'll be joining you soon there. Thanks. So, thank you, sir. Is all in all, our just host. because I come, you take leave. Is that so? <laughs> I'm so scared. Actually, we are the same person, so we can't be there together in the same place. <laughs> anyway, what I mean to say now, reality. <laughs> I can't say he's the host, actually. So, he's the host. The all in all in this conference with more than 5,000 But delegates. thank you, Dr. Biswas, for accepting my IC. Before I leave, I wanted to make that clear for next year also. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So here we have an innovator, an erudite, extremely hardworking. You must be seeing how hardworking he is, working day and night. I haven't seen his face. I'm seeing him only here for the last 15 days. So a genius surgeon, innovator. Well, here he is, my brother in arms with at BBI Foundation. Yes, welcome. Thank you very much, Ajay. Thank you for including me in your IC. And it's always a pleasure to be in your IC. So, so this uh, video that uh, we'll ha we have here and uh, this is one of spherophakia, which uh, Ajay wanted me to share with you. And how it was then and how it is now, what are the changes in the technique of spherophakia is what we will dwell upon. So what microspherophakia was actually a decade back and how it has changed is important because with the change has become more and more important that we actually take up these changes.
And this microsphere of Akia, and uh, this was nearly 10 years ago, how we would do. And uh, I'll stop in these difficult, difficult procedures where we had to do this capsular access. And look at this balloon of a spherophakic lens, which hardly can be punctured. And look at the whole lens shifting onto one side while I'm trying to puncture it with an MVR knife. And, uh, and look how important now I was quite unsuccessful there. And so now I'm going to, I'm puncturing it with uh, actually a double-handed technique in which I'm trying to support the anterior capsule. And uh, then it is getting punctured with the 26 gauge needle. So at last a puncture is made with the 26 gauge needle. And then a counter tension has to be given. And this part of the whole technique is the time taking technique. It nearly took me 10 to 15 minutes to gradually, gradually complete it and come to an end. This part of the procedure is of course not so difficult, not quite simple, but here uh, one or two practical aspects. Should we use a capsular hook or should we use an iris hook? So the iris hooks are smaller and this microspherophakic bags bag is also a small bag. Therefore, the capsular hook in all its integrity and all its finesse is quite a large one and can actually destabilize the microspherophakic bag. So uh, iris hook, but gently can be used and uh, can gently hold that whole bag in place. So then we put in the intraocular lens and then by and by, as you can see, we are putting in the two amid segments. So the amid segments are again very important. And uh, if you uh, look into this part, you will see that the amid segments are actually, look at this and you can see the two amid segments actually encompassing the whole bag. So you don't need to put a CTR and a CTR, even if it has to be put, it has to be a very small one. Otherwise it will actually rupture the whole bag itself if it is a nine millimeter or 10 millimeter diameter CTR. The next part, of course, is the more important part. And these microspherophakic lenses have deficient zonules. So you have to anchor them and you have to have them in place optimally done. And once that is done, then you have the intraocular lenses in place, the microspherophakic bag, fine and in place. So if it is in place and the patient actually enjoys very good vision, this is our whole team which looked after this child. And this is her sister who came nearly five, uh, six years later. And uh, after this, what we had uh, for her is something different. At that point of time, we had the uh, femtosecond laser and with the femtosecond laser, we went on to do a femtosecond laser capsular excess. Then the capsular excess is the important part and you can see it's a microspherophakic bag and we are changing the parameters because look at that whole globus, it's nearly a sphere. So we need to compute it manually and to see that it is done. What was important is the 1.5 second capsulotomy that is important. But now look what we had. So after doing off the capsulotomy, we do a Hoffman's uh, pocket. And with the Hoffman's pocket, it's a much more elegant way of uh, dealing with it. And then we enter in. And uh, now if you can look at this part. So at that point of time, I was not too good of doing a capsular excess and uh, the settings had to be changed and you can see it's nearly a posted stamp. So here was the question, will I get a full rexus or not? Well, I went ahead and we tried it out and uh, we did get a rexus out of it. Uh, the spherophakic bag was undaunted and this rexus we could make in just about two to three minutes. So it's quite important this in such particular instances to have the femtosecond laser in place because what you want to do is to retain this microsphere of taking back. The next part is very simple. The 
iris hooks hold it in place and the microspherophytic bag is very nicely there in place but every time you definitely need to put in the hooks to stabilize it and uh, then of course the intraocular lens a single piece intraocular lens that you would like to put so the optic itself is 6.5 millimeters and what happens to the haptics now this particular lens i don't have any financial interest but these uh, um, alcon single piece lenses are phenomenal because the optics right on crowd on its on the optic the haptics are very pliable and uh, the haptics in place they very nicely sit in the spherophytic bag so uh, putting in the amet segments are important and the amet segments will retain the spherophytic bag in place for the years and years to come they have to be put in gently and again that optimal tie needs to be done so what you saw from the previous to the one that we are showing you now is quite different so what we have is the microspherophytic bag nicely in place and you can see that the bag is a small one and thereby the in the smith dilated pupil both the amet segments parts are in in uh, nearly the pupil area this is this is actually mid dilated so with this mid dilated bag did this patient have difficulty of glare and halos not really and uh, <clears throat> the pupil actually comes down and even if there is a little bit of glare and halo the patient accepts it because the patient is usually an amblyopic patient so this was a little family story of two sisters who got done the microspherophakia in two different ways thank you very much for your patient hearing thank you patro that was an amazing amazing way of doing the surgeries i think uh, if we could take some question from anybody shaddat or priya anything i mean this was uh, wonderful i think priya showed us some beautiful surgeries even shaddat showed us some beautiful with the yeah anything anything would be fun because we have 5 minutes i think uh, priya had already told us when using those lens uh, you have to put in some fluid inside and about you part uh, about uh, getting those you know the right parameters in femtosecond because we are now coming i think that has really made the difference but then uh, what, what did you did you lift up the uh, the the focus points or uh, increase the power yes uh, so in this uh, the parameters actually the thickness of the anterior capsule is more and that was one review of literature we did after doing this capsulotomy we should have put in a little more energy and uh, the repetition rate should have, should have been a little more so this we realized later and uh, for the other patients especially for the ones with high, the thick anterior uh, capsule especially the ones with fibrosed uh, capsule in the white cataracts we increase the uh, energy and thereby get a better capsular access uh, capsular tomy than in other other patients so these are the few things that we uh, did and tried uh, so one thing uh, the suture material you were using for uh, tying those uh, amet segments uh, uh, did you try gortex as well because uh, i have found that it's really expensive and it's only available with the uh, cardiothoracic surgeons yeah right so i think professor chi is here and um, professor chi welcome to india and uh, uh, professor chi has shown us how to use gortex and uh, though it's not very freely available here it is available and uh, quite a lot of our surgeons are using for this patient we did not use the gortex and uh, of course it is one technique that we should learn because it's not exactly the same way as you would do with the uh, tensile nylon so it's important that uh, the gortex has to be learned and uh, but that's the way to go because gortex does not disintegrate and it's a lifetime of uh, strong bondage as well as a good fixation for the segments in the thing and the back uh, i wanted to ask one question to dr chi uh, uh, in india we somehow managed to get the gortex in chair but the needle that we get is a small curved one do you also have the same issues because then we have to 
you know cut off that needle or we have to flatten that curved needle into a straight and then try to pass it from the uh, you know from the bore of the device that we are using so do you have a special uh, any other kind of uh, thing or uh, it's the same status everywhere okay so if you look at my publication in bjo 2018 i described the use of a suture snare and it's really a very simple device yes. where you thread a 27 gauge needle with this uh, short segment about 10 cm of the center of the suture and uh, when you thread it there are a few tips all right so the first one is that when you cut the suture you want to cut it so that it's tapered at the end yeah so it's easy to thread through easy a 27 gauge right. now the second point is that when you handle the suture your hand your glove should be dry because the moment it is wet, it becomes limp and you're unable to thread it, okay? So if you have a dry glove and you handle it, it remains straight and it just goes straight in through the 27 gauge half inch needle. At the end of that, you use a 1cc syringe or whichever syringe you wish to catch the end so that it does not slip out again. And then you just bend it at your usual angle, right? For, for anchoring to the sclera. And that when you push into the sclera at the fixation point, would double on itself. Correct. And therefore, when you, you know, the other trick is that when you go in, you just pull that needle back a little and that will loosen the suture so that there's a little loop that you can use a Kuglen hook to just extend. And that Kuglen hook, you can extend it from any paracentesis that's convenient. And then later you take that loop out through the main incision. So that now is a lasso, and through that, you take the suture that you want to actually fixate, bearing your um, sioni or your capsule tension segment. You just pull that loop of, of uh, lasso out at the scarab point, and you brought your suture there. So yeah, that's how you can avoid the needle. I understood, like, uh, the way uh, you were doing it. I absolutely understood how it is being done. Actually, yes. even I have used uh, the Gore-Tex in one or two cases. But I really want to tell the manufacturers that please come up with some good needles so that, you know, it saves time for us. And, uh, you know, you can just finish up things fast. Otherwise, you have to, uh, you, it gets prolonged. It's almost double the time uh, you have to keep on, you know, looping those sutures and getting out of it. But when you do it often enough, right, it's yeah. really fast. Yes, it's okay. Fast. It's like using a snare, you, you know. Actually, you need snare. to have that into your mind. It is something like, you know, when we do a sewing machine for aerodialysis, those loops coming out and threading yes. coming in and out. Yes. Absolutely, it is the same kind of thing. Thank you. Uh, I have one question with yeah. The, yeah. for Dr. Chi. Like, uh, how do you manage the retina examination and other things when uh, you implant a... Uh, uh, you know, iris, artificial iris that you've shown. Because I was that exactly difference. going to ask the same question. Okay, so really, you know, it's been published that you can even do a retinal surgery through that 3.5 mm pupil. And I don't have problems checking the retina. Definitely, you know, if you use even a 30 diopter, you can see right to the periphery. Yeah, so it's safe. And do you have any incidents of glaucoma in your series? Okay, I thought I, I had asked that before. I mean, those okay, okay. Anyway, thank you, thank you, Dr. Chi, Dr. Partha, thank Dr. You. Chetra, Dr. Priya, Dr. Siddhartha, Dr. Biraj, and Dr. Shujo for being here and for I invite again Dr. Chi for the next year also. And everybody, I would like to have you next year also in the same course. It has been a wonderful teaching and experience. Thank you. Thank you. Learning thank you. and teaching for all of so, us. Ajay thank you so is much. inviting thank you, you so only much. for the next year annual conference. I'm <laughs> inviting you throughout the year for all our webinars as well. Yes, yes. Dr. Chi. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank Very you. soon, thank Professor you. Chi, you need to take an Indian citizenship. Yes. Very yes. soon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Doctor, for the lovely session. We will now move on to the